Please be seated. I am continuously amazed how social media, Facebook and other social media platforms, gives us reason to tell a story with so few words. Sometimes it's not even words, it's a picture. I have a few Facebook friends, not many. And I am just amazed at how much they can say with so little, so often. I think I know more about them than I ever knew about them when I actually had regular human contact with them. I know what they eat, sometimes, because it appears on Facebook. I know where they go. I know who they're with, and I start to learn more and more about their story, even from a long distance. You know, Christians don't need Facebook to tell a story. We don't need a reason or an excuse to tell the story. We don't need any prompting. Because we all have the same story to tell. It gets told with different words and different pictures and different experiences, but it's the same story. But the funny thing is about us Christians, sometimes we can be shy about telling the story. It's easy with Facebook because we can do it in the car, in our house, wherever we are. We can just post something and it, it, we're not seen or nobody's really in it. In, Countering us, but, but to tell the story that, that God asks us to tell is a little different. Somehow we've been conditioned over the years to believe that, that the faith story is a personal story that, that really maybe shouldn't be shared as much as we ought to. Somehow we've been conditioned to think that the personal faith story is not a public matter. The Gospel tells us that's not the case. It is true that faith is a personal matter, but a personal faith is meant to be manifested publicly. So Jesus said to his disciples in a public way, this will provide you with an opportunity to testify. This will provide you with an opportunity to testify. And that opportunity comes in some very difficult conditions and situations. There is a certain awkwardness that comes with introducing religion into a conversation. We're often unsure of, of how it will be received if we start to profess our faith publicly in conversation. Some of you have heard me say uh, often that when I'm in public or social situations in maybe among a lot of new people who do not know who I am or what I do. When they do find out that I am a minister, there are often two or three responses. One is silence. <coughs> the other is a nod. And then the last one is a disappearing act. <laughs> I find myself standing by myself. <laughs> no, I, I guess I am not considered to be the life of the party. <laughs> but however, there are often times, too, I ought to say, that there are opportunities that come with my introduction as a minister. And there are blessings because people will open up and testify to me. They take an opportunity to tell me their faith story and I learn a lot. Sometimes I just listen and I don't say a thing. But it's an individual who is willing to, to capture that, that moment, that, to take that time when the opportunity presents to share, to testify. 
There's another time when the opportunity comes to testify to one's faith. This is a time when, when a set of circumstances uh, in life start to unravel the fabric of life. When things are not as tightly knit together as they once were, and, and the fabrics of life, whether it's uh, employment or health or relationships, they start to unravel and that fabric starts to get a little thin. And that's a time when often it's so important that we bring faith into our conversations. You may know what I mean. It's the unexpected loss. It's the disappointment or illness. It's a time when a family or friend member gives voice to his or her doubt or anger about God. It's a time for testimony. It's an opportunity. Sometimes we don't take it. We're quiet. These are opportunities to testify to God's love and to God's promise. It's a, it's a time not for preaching. It's a time for listening and then making just a simple public confession. I know the Lord is with you. I, I know God will guide you in this situation. I believe that Jesus knows what you're going through and even more. I'll pray for you. Friends, we gather on the first Sunday after the presidential election. As I said earlier, today is very different than it was last night. Today we gather, and I imagine there are few that are here this morning that even expected the election of Donald Trump. I will not ask for a raising of the hands, but I imagine there's a few that didn't expect Donald Trump. To be but here we are. Donald Trump is our president elect. We're dealing with this situation that many of his supporters and opponents did not expect. We're not prepared for it. And for some, there is this, this strong hope about a rebuilding of the nation to make America great again. And they believe that. Some of us here believe that in all sincerity, and we ought to respect one another. And then there are others in our community and those that might be here, present here, that, that are living in the reality of, of fear, a real fear, <clears throat> even to the point of dread that what is going to happen? How are things going to change? How is this going to affect my, my life? And whatever it may be. And so regardless where we stand on the outcome of the election, all of us stand in the midst of expected change. We all stand in the same place where change is going to come, and we all stand in the midst of a divided nation. Whether you're looking at that map of red and blue states, or you're listening to the news and hearing of all the demonstrations in the major cities of our nation, or you're at the water cooler in the office or the coffee shop, you can hear the division. We, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're, we're living in this time of, of mixed emotions, of expectant hope and change and fear and dread and, and division. We're wondering how all this will play out in the days and months and years to come. We feel the foundations Again, the foundations of our own self and in the foundations of the, of the nation. But we thanks be to God that the, the democratic process and as the prayer card came forward this morning, there was a transfer of peaceful power that we must be grateful and thankful for. It's not like the times when Jesus was living. Jesus had come to Jerusalem and he stand, stood before this huge economic, political, religious project that's called the, the Temple of Jerusalem. It took decades upon decades to build it. Thousands upon thousands of workers, many, many, many died working tirelessly day after day to build this huge temple. It's adorned with jewels and gold on the inside and all these ornate sculptures on the outside. It was just an amazing thing. And pilgrims would arrive there daily, not believing their 
eyes. And they would stand and just silently stare at the structure. And one day Jesus was there and all these pilgrims, including his disciples, were, were staring at this beautiful temple and, and they were admiring it. And Jesus says, you know what? One day there will be not one stone standing of this temple. I couldn't believe it. What, what do you mean, Jesus? I, I, it's taken all this time and all this, all this effort, all this, all this money uh, to build this beautiful structure, and you're telling us that one day it'll all be gone. Yes, Jesus said. In spite of all the grandeur that this great temple of Jerusalem represented, the second temple, by the way, the second one built, Jesus was not afraid to proclaim the future when the temple would be destroyed by the hands of the enemy. Jesus was not afraid to speak of the future disasters that would, would come and the unraveling of life as one knows it. Jesus talked about how these changes would come. This included not only the destruction of the temple, but it also included what would happen to the lives of his followers. He said, before all this even comes, you, my followers, you need to know this, that you will be brought before kings and governors. You will be even divided within your family, all because of my name. My name. Who I am and what I stand for. You should know this. His disciples listened carefully. They listened carefully with their hearts, and, and they listened as Jesus was not afraid to speak of the future and how their own lives would, would start to come unraveling. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says, You know what? In the midst of all this, you're going to have an opportunity to testify. To testify. To tell the story. I can't imagine how hard it was for the disciples and those that heard it to, to take hold of that message, to, to understand it. But Jesus forewarned his disciples that the plan of God for all of creation would come and that they would not escape it, but it would be a time for them to actively await for it to arrive. And when I say actively waiting, it means an opportunity to witness to one's faith in God, even under the stress of times and conditions. Even though they knew what was to come, Jesus was encouraging them to stand strong with courage and boldness to continue to tell the story of God's love. Even though all these circumstances and conditions were about to change, that they would still be committed to their faith in Him and what God has planned for all of creation. This morning, Frank read from the prophet Isaiah, the, the last book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 65, talking about this, this, this vision that Isaiah had of hope and promise. When all of that God was, was undoing the destruction of the first temple, God still had this message for the prophet to share that, that, that things would be put back together, made new, restored. And that the people of God, the, the people of Jerusalem, who would hold fast to this, this belief and this idea that they could actively wait and help to build what God is about to reveal them. The new creation, the new heaven. Where there'd be no more hunger, there'd be no more homelessness, there'd be all were working and be earning from their fields, and, and enemies would be friends. The lamb and the lion. This morning in the testimony from the prophet Isaiah is a testimony of hope. The world for the prophet was unraveled. The first temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed, as I said, and it was time for Isaiah to speak to his people to stay faithful to God's promise of new life. It was that time for actively awaiting God to act by holding fast, to living out God's promise for justice and peace. And so, friends, when I speak of the unraveling of life, I am not simply taking poetic license. 
I'm speaking of the real life circumstances that lead to human suffering and pain, the unraveling of life. Jesus spoke of this with regards to his own life and his disciples' lives simply because of their faith. Disciples today in many parts of the world still know the pain of professing Christ. There are still martyrs. There are still Christians in prison because they dare to profess their faith in the face of those powers, those governors, those kings that say no to the Christ that they love. We as Christians in the United States, we are not subject to, to religious persecution. However, this does not mean we do not live free of pain and suffering. The prophet Isaiah spoke of the coming healing and restoration of all creation. This is a message for all of us. Isaiah pointed the people of God towards a new reality, giving them a plan to work towards. Jesus called his disciples to accept the opportunities to testify to God's saving plan for all creation in the face of the unraveling of life. These opportunities Jesus pointed to are, are not going to be in the best of times. As a matter of fact, the opportunity to testify to God's love will come in the most challenging and difficult times of our private lives and our communal lives. That's why we have to learn not to be quiet in the face of these challenges, this unraveling that we may feel in our lives. Sisters and brothers in Christ, we are entering into an opportune time. Every time is an opportunity. But I feel in my heart that we're entering, entering into a, a new time, a new opportune time for the church. Change is on its way. It's coming. Change that will be welcomed by some and feared by others. It's coming. And I, for one, see opportunity in this time of change, opportunity for the church, for Christians, for disciples, to testify and act on God's promise of love and justice. Because there's another narrative that's being preached out there in the streets. It's bringing tension and disruption. And it's the job of the church to hold fast to its vocation, its occupation, which is to share the story of the good news. <coughs> I see this opportunity to testify and act upon God's promise coming fast. And I will encourage you to join me and to hold fast to the vision of the prophet Isaiah, the vision of a whole people of God. God has placed this church, this community of faith, in very particular circumstances that are now even bolder and more highlighted as we move forward in ministry together. God has a purpose for this church and this place and this time. The opportunity is upon us for this church to testify to God's love, and unity, and justice. We are a church that has been blessed by newcomers. We are a church that has been blessed by immigrants and migrants from Ghana, Jamaica, and other parts of the world. Now, if that is not a unique situation and circumstance in the life of the church in this place and time, I don't know what is. Because if there's any group that is on the top five list that's feeling the change of fear and dread, it is the immigrant community. And the church is called to testify to the wholeness and the unity of God's people. Now, outside this church, are countless newcomers to this nation. Monday through Friday, dozens of newcomers to this nation come here to study and to develop skills that will allow them to move forward in life. 
Now that is a testimony that this church and all churches should join and neighbors alike, volunteers, people of faith and not of any faith to say to the world that all of God's people are welcome. And the church has to be at the forefront of that testimony. This church is in a very particular situation and circumstance and place because next door to us I can almost reach out of that window and lay my hand on a mosque. And if there's another group within our community that's feeling some fear, it's our Muslim brothers and sisters, our neighbors. The church, and this church has, been in loving, caring partnership with our Muslim neighbors. You see, God has given the church all churches, but this church right here in its own way, as every church has in its own way, very particular circumstances to testify and opportunities to testify who we are and what God longs for us. For we are a community of faith that is actively waiting God's full restoration of creation, and we're going to work on it just as the Lord's Prayer says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In spite of all that's unraveling around us in different ways through the media and anxiety and, and expectation, in spite of that, we who we are are going to do what we're called to do, which is to testify over and over with voice and with actions louder and louder to God's love for God's people. And we as followers of Jesus are called to enter into the fear and struggle of our neighbors. We're not to, to, to look at it from a distance. We're, we're to get into the fear and the struggle of our neighbors, to walk hand in hand, just as Jesus did with those that were fearful and struggling in their own lives. And that's hard to do sometimes, but that's the opportunity that God calls us to respond to, to tell the story, to share, and to live out God's word. And it all comes down to these simple words that we're going to hear in just a minute. It comes down to these words that are, that are wrapped in, this, in this, this sacrament of baptism, the baptismal vows. It's, it's all right there. We as followers of Jesus are called in our baptismal vows to, to enter into the struggle of our neighbors, to proclaim the message of God in Christ. We are called to stay with our immigrant neighbors and, our, and, and to live into and out of our baptismal vows. It's a personal promise that we make in our vows at baptism time to, to resist evil and oppression. It's a personal vow that we make to employ the freedom that God gives us to actively testify against such powers that would seek to separate us or to dehumanize others or to bring hate into the world. Christians, we don't need a reason to tell the story. Not at all. We don't need excuses to share our faith experiences. Christians have a mandate, a gospel mandate from Jesus to accept every opportunity that comes our way to be Christ-like. To be Christ-like. That's what it means to be a Christian. To be vocal and visible with our faith, actively waiting for God to complete God's work and the full reconciliation and restoration of all of creation. But in the meantime, we follow the plan of Isaiah as God shared it with him to do the work of justice. Yes, brothers and sisters, the political world, as we know, is changing. But what is not changing? It's God, God's promise of love for us. Saving love for all of humanity. The church changes with the times. But only to bring forward that unchanging message that God has given to us in Jesus Christ. The love of God for God's people. And the saving grace that turns us all around and makes us new. We as followers of Jesus must work hard at every opportunity to testify. And sometimes your testimony is nothing 
close to words. It's an act. It's often said that the best sermon that I ever witnessed was not one that I heard, but one that I saw. And I would say that about testimony. Witnessing, too. Because we can say a lot of things. But our community, our neighbors, are waiting for the church to be the church. And so my prayer is as we go out together into the world in these new times that are coming, that we grow stronger, more vocal and bolder in our actions about what it means to be a follower of Jesus in the times that are are sometimes even tougher than we expect. Amen. Amen.